John's going to turn. There we go. Good morning. Welcome to this Sunday's contemporary music service. Family and friends and visitors alike, we're happy you have come to share the service with us. I have a few announcements before we get started. The Trinity North Regional CPWM will meet Saturday, September 11th, 9 o'clock a.m. at Pine Tree CPC. A light continental breakfast and registration will begin at 8.30. The offering collected will be given to the Stott Wallace Missionary Fund and CPW Convention highlights will be presented by Reverend Christy Lounsbury, Director of Congregational Ministries, and Sherry Poteet, the Trinity North Regional CPWM delegate. All ladies are encouraged to attend. Our diaconate will meet today at 1230 in the conference room. Awanis kickoff this Saturday, August 14th, beginning at 4 p.m., we will be having a kickoff party for ages three years old through sixth grade, along with parents and helpers of our new Awanis program. We encourage all our children, <coughs> excuse me, to come and enjoy. If you would like to help, please let Isabel Martinez know. And uh, I know yesterday they had a training session here. So uh, they're all trained, they're all nervous, the leaders are, but they're ready to get started. We will be honoring Pastor Rusty with a retirement reception on August 22nd at 3 p.m. We need your help in providing finger foods and helping set up and clean up. There are sign-up sheets in the narthex, so be sure to indicate how you can serve during this special time. As part of that retirement reception, we will be giving Pastor Rusty a gift from the congregation. To help with the purchase of the gift, you are encouraged to put your donation in an envelope, mark it for Pastor Rusty's gift, or if using a check, make it out to the church and indicate it is for the gift in the memo line. This morning, we're going to welcome to our pulpit, Reverend Adrian Scott. Brother Scott is a Cumberland Presbyterian minister, and we look forward to his sharing the good news with us today. The uh, chairman of our pastoral search committee, Joe Cucinata, would like to share a few things with you. Good morning, all. Uh, I want to apologize for being a little remiss in uh, addressing you all about what we've been doing. Uh, I know we've been putting it in the bulletin and everything, but... Uh, we are diligently searching, and I know there's been some rumors that we've had 100 applicants. Uh, we've had six, so I want to squelch that. Um, and now that's six, most of them are probably going to leave us in the same situation we're in right now a couple years down the road, and so that's not what we're trying to accomplish. We want somebody that's going to be here long-term in service and be a part of our family. And uh, so I ask, uh, and we are right now also looking for an interim, uh, searching diligently, diligently for that, and we've got lots of feelers and talked to a lot of people throughout the country about, um, you know, helping us out, trying to find somebody. So uh, if you have any questions, we're not a closed committee or team there, so just ask. Be feel free to ask me or any one of us, and we'd be happy to fill you in on what's going on. Thank you. Please pray with me. Our Father, we bow before you. We have gathered today for fellowship with you. Let your presence be felt in Jesus' name. We are your people and the sheep in your pasture. We have gathered in your church to bring our praise and thanksgiving. We are not worthy to receive you, but accept our prayers in your name. Bless us as this service progresses and grant our petitions in Jesus' name. Amen.
thank you. Thank you, precious Father. Use these songs of praise and worship and this message spoken today to awaken and anew your Holy Spirit in us, Amen. to be a light in us so that we may go and be your servants in the world. You alone, God. God, you are our hope and you are our salvation. Father, we will walk in your ways and we will stand in faith on your promises that never changes and never fails. In your precious and holy name, amen.
I was going to tell you that uh, I've been working with Penny on her singing at home, and <laughs> evidently it's paying off. Sorry. <laughs> well, Nancy Fessler can tell you I even have a hard time talking in tune, so. Uh, thank you all very much. All right. During the time that uh, I go through the people that we need to be thinking about and praying for, if uh, you want to bring your offering forward in the baskets in the aisles, that would be the time to do that. <clears throat> we offer our prayers and sympathy to Maria Garcia's family in the loss of her brother, Fernando Garcia. He was killed in a car accident last week. Maria is the mother of Carla Chavez, who plays the piano with Christy Godwin in the Contemporary Worship Service. Martha Spencer is back in Marshall Hospital with pneumonia. She is seriously ill, and Chuck and Sandra Spencer covet your prayers on her behalf. Claire F Fletcher continues to recover from bronchitis and related issues. Miss Dolores Rustenhaven has been diagnosed with a blood clot, and she is recovering at home. Remember to pray for our Awana Children's Wednesday evening program as it begins. And aside from the program, uh, pray for all those that have volunteered to lead this program. As it's, it's new to so many of our volunteers, and they're all nervous, but they're ready to get started. So keep them in your prayers. Juliana Dean, the daughter-in-law of David and Debbie uh, was taken to the hospital last night with some pregnancy complications and that's, that's entirely what we know at this point. So and keep us updated on other prayer concerns. Of course, you can always call the church office if you, you need to add people. Let us pray. Lord, your word speaks promises of healing and restoration. And I thank you for the many miracles you perform every day. Today, we claim these miracles over our friends and loved ones that we have mentioned. We believe in your healing powers of faith and prayer, and we ask you to begin your mighty work in the lives of these people. Reach down and surround them with peace and strength. Protect them from Satan's lies and discouragement once again. We pray you let your healing begin. Amen.
It's my pleasure and honor this morning to welcome to our pulpit Reverend Adrian Scott. Brother Scott is a Cumberland Presbyterian minister, and we look forward to his sharing the good news with us today. Welcome, Doc Scott. Good morning. Good morning. Let's try it once again. Good morning. Oh, you're awake now. Excellent. It's a joy and privilege to be here this morning. We thank God for the ministry of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church Marshall for the many years of service to the kingdom of Christ, the excellent work you've done in this community and also around the world through your participation in missions. I bring you greetings from uh, Arlington, Texas. My wife Cynthia is with me this morning and I'm grateful for that. Such an honor to be here, and we also pay, pay our respects to uh, Pastor Rusty and uh, also congratulate him on his retirement. Uh, wink, wink. Uh, he's been fast at work, I understand, but uh, our thank, we're thankful to God for uh, the work that he's done and continues to do. I'd like to ask you if you would turn in your Bibles to the 21st chapter of the book of <clears throat> Numbers. Numbers chapter 21, read verses 1 through 9. I'm actually reading the New King James Version, <clears throat> so it may sound a little different than the Bible that you're using. Numbers chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. The king of Arad, the Canaanite who dwelt in the south, Heard that Israel was coming on the road to Atherim, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of that place was called Hormah. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a per serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the preceding chapters of Numbers, particularly the beginning with the 11th chapter, they chronicled a deep satisfaction of the nation of Israel since they've been delivered from their misery of slavery in the land of Egypt. They found every conceivable thing to complain about, including the manna and the quail, the baked bread and cooked quail, as someone once called it. And they referred to these miraculous feedings as miserable food in the fifth verse of our chapter. The Israelites also complained about the water or the lack thereof. They complained about the hardships of travel and the size, physical size of the opponents in the land of Canaan whom they were expected to defeat in battle. They even accused God of delivering them from Egypt only to see them die in the wilderness and on and on and on their list of complaints went. This is a cyclical history of Israel wandering from God, committing gross sins, then their eventual repentance and the forgiveness that God grants them. The Israelites were actually moving closer to the land that God had promised them, the land of Canaan. They were operating on the promises of God. And in return for God's 
favor of a victory over the Canaanites. They promised the Lord they in return would repent and return to God in obedience. If they're going to successfully overcome the Canaanites, they strategized to travel to Canaan, taking the shortest route, then attacking once they were within distance. However, in order for this military strategy to work, that is to travel the shortest, most direct route through to Canaan, rather through Edom, uh, the Edomites had to help facilitate this. When Moses asked permission of the Edomites, the Edomites refused them. Their only recourse was to take the longer route in order to secure a place in the land of promise. They had to take that way, that long way around the land of Edom, along the Red Sea, and it was an arduous journey for them. Long journey, hot, weary, dusty, a rocky road, and the terrain uneven. Additionally, Moses' sister Miriam, who was his supporter and often an encourager to him, along with Moses' brother Aaron, who served as a priest and right-hand man. Chapter 20 records that they both died. In a moment of frustration and maybe anger, or maybe both, the Israelites spoke out against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Their world, as they knew it, was crumbling. They were traveling. And the road there, the track to Canaan, was difficult, to say the least. Two of their leaders had died. There's frustration and anger. Life's become more difficult. The Israelites, whose hearts were hardened and bitter by their life's hard trials, they felt emboldened, and perhaps some of even the younger families joined in, and they hurled their insults at the very God of Israel, who so very recently, miraculously and mercifully, delivered them from the hand of Egypt's oppression. It was as if they were chastising God, shaking their fist at the Almighty because of their troubles. To dare chastise God is the highest and most audacious of human acts. And to compare mere human intellect to divine wisdom is the evidence of a significant lack of faith and sound judgment coupled with an overabundance of human arrogance and self-pride. With this latest and most blatant attempt on God's good judgment, the Lord sent fiery serpents into the camp and they bit the people so that many of the Israelites died, verse 6. A line had been drawn in the sand and Israel has crossed that line. And even the very casual reading of our text teaches us something very, very basic. And here is that lesson. Sin has its often horrible consequences. The campers are not only ungrateful, but they are tired, they're frustrated, they're bitter, they're angry. They possess a critical spirit, and now they're also sick and afraid, and many of them die. In our mind's eye, we can envision the fatality strewn all over this Israelite camp. People are dying, and they're dying indiscriminately. It's a mess. Has your life ever looked or felt like a mess? If something isn't done, potentially everyone in the camp could die. We could certainly say that Israel was an undeserving people. With the death count of family and friends dying from poisonous venom, it's obvious there's something deadly in this serpent's bite. And here is the Bible's true appraisal of sin. Sin is deadly. It seems that every tent and every family has its victims. The death toll is rising. Homes are quickly being left fatherless. They're being left motherless, even childless. 
In this instance, the even-handedness and non-discriminating arm of divine justice is the chilly hand of death. And I ask you a question this morning as we're pondering our text here. Is this serpent's bite somehow a picture of the stinging, deadly nature of sin with its dire consequences of pain, sorrow, regret, and ultimately death and separation? And if so, are these Israelites the only ones bitten by the serpent? I say no. All of humanity beginning with Adam's fall was born in sin and shapen in iniquity, the King James Version says. Another version says that we were brought forth in iniquity, which speaks of the humanity's quote-unquote inherited depravity, according to F.F. F. Bruce. Or it is the state of human beings at birth. Paul said it in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were injected with the venom of disobedience and rebellion against God's heavenly authority. And the effects of sin is, it still stings. Because of sin, we live in the stress of family and work-life balance. That stings. The issues of aging poorly, that stings. The crumbling family structure in our culture, it stings. The loss of personal relationships, the loss of good health, they sting. And what about the frail financial concerns that many have? They all sting. The result of sin still stings. Verse 7, the people in their self-pity and in a moment of honesty, they said this, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. They're talking to Moses. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. We don't want any more of this. And here is open confession. Here is confession, which the Bible says is good for the soul. The people realize the snakes, these snakes, these troubles, these fiery bites and deadly sickness, these feelings of self-righteousness which they possessed, feelings of self-sufficiency and arrogance, this anger and bitterness and complaining, it will not leave them on its own. No, they need a God intervention. They need God to provide a remedy for the pain that they're experiencing. They can't chase out these serpents. They need God's help. The Lord would help them, but it would require of them a measure of faith. Make a fiery serpent, the Lord tells Moses. Set it on a pole and then run to the center of the camp and stand there and hold it as high as you can. And everyone who is bitten, oh, what an indiscriminate solution. Everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, he shall live, verse 8. This is God's remedy for the sick and dying in Israel. And there is no other solution offered. If you want to live, you will look at what is hoisted on this pole. No other offer is being made. No other remedy for the calamity that's fallen upon the camp of Israel. There is no other solution. No other cure is offered. Just this one. One chance to live and not die. To look at a dead, lifeless figure on a pole was the only instruction for life and healing. It's a simple prescription, however. And to those who dared cast a saving look, God promised to forgive and they will live. They would not have to die without a savior. That serpent on a pole was an accurate representation of the fiery serpents that had stung and had affected the camp of Israel. The serpent served as a mirror of their sin, the reason for their condition. Now someone in the camp, I'm sure, thought, the last thing I want to do is to look at something that reminds me of my sin. 
that reminds me why father, mother, sister, or brother is dying and why I'm sick and have the same fate. Someone else may have thought, come on, this is too simple. This doesn't make any sense. There's no connection between this remedy and this proposal from God in science. It doesn't make any sense. The last thing I want to do is to be reminded of my sin. But isn't that the point? It served to remind them of their sin and their guilt. And remind them also of one who would take away their guilt and the pain. God's solution is greater than the problem. They're weak and dying. Their life is fleeing from their frail bodies. They cannot walk to the serpent. They can't run to the serpent. Lest they think it's their own efforts that save them. So a simple prescription was written. Amid such pitiful conditions, such horrific suffering and numbing sorrow, Moses points them to the one lifted up. Look to the one who heals in sickness, who soothes our sorrows and lifts our burdens. The one who gives us peace in troubling times and sends a wave of hope to us when otherwise we're drowning in hopelessness. Look at that figure who is hoisted high and hung high enough and long enough for everyone who dared look at it would live. No. That pole wasn't only to be there for a few seconds. Catch it quickly and you'll live. It wasn't to be there for a minute or three. The serpent was lifted and hoisted high on that pole long enough so that everyone who dared look in faith would live. People of Israel, look to the one hoisted high above the chaos of this camp. Look to the one that's lifted up for you. This is the work of God for you and for me. Just look this way. The text has its biblical and historical significance, of course, but it's also clearly pointing us to the one hoisted on a wooden beam 2,000 years ago, whose whole purpose was to be a reminder of our sin, but more importantly, reminder that he is our substitute, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Be reminded of the simplicity of the gospel message. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. John 3, 15. You can look at this one on the tree, stretched wide and hung high, because no, this one has no poison. Jesus had no sin. He doesn't represent death. This one hung high and strung wide he brings life. I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. John says in John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus knew no sin. Notice that the figure on the pole has the power of life and death, and so it is in Christ. We can look to him and live, or we can refuse to look to Jesus and die. If you will only look in faith. Look to this one lifted, elevated high above all others and fixed on a pole. You will not perish if you do, but have life. Now this is a call to Israel's obedience and saving faith in the word of God. Moses simply told the Israelites what God had told him. And so it is with everyone today. How can they hear without a preacher? How can he preach except he be sent? It's a call to their obedience and saving faith. Only look this way. Romans 5, 6 says that while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And you may ask, what is the right time? The right time is while there still is time. 
Don't look at the poll, however. Don't be confused. It's not the poll that will give them salvation, that will deliver them from their troubles and heal them of their sickness. Look at the figure on the poll. If you're tired, look. If you're weary, look. If you're frustrated, look. Lonely, look. If you're heartbroken, look. If you're troubled, look. If you are hurting, look. And when you look, Jesus will work. The Bible says that when they looked that way, death and separation. When they looked that way, they were healed. They lived. Hopelessness must take leave. Sickness and pain was left fleeing. And life replaced death. Because of that look, death no longer had power over those who dared look to the one lifted up for them. This is the hope we have in Jesus, who is the author of the beginner and the finisher of our faith. Look at the one who is lifted up for you and for me. Well, what is our text saying? In short, is this. Look to the one who was fastened to the tree by the will of God, hoisted high by the pleasure of God, and who hung there by the patience of God, and who died there because of the love of God. If sin has taken its toll upon you, look to Jesus. The cross is the answer for the pain of sin. Christian, if you are again weary of sin's sting, have you in your anger or bitterness or shame refused to look to Jesus, our healer? Do you feel like you're entitled? You deserve the Lord's forgiveness and healing, but it hasn't come. Our text reminds us of our unworthiness. Saints as well as sinners, I point you to Jesus. Look this way. And no matter what the consequences of sin may be manifest in your life. Anger, disappointment, frustration, sickness. Look to the one who only can bring healing and wholeness. If you look to Jesus, Jesus can heal us. And in him is life. In my closing, may I finish with this quote that someone once said that a crossless Christianity does not exist. May I encourage you to look the way of the cross of Christ. God bless you.
receive the Lord's benediction, grace, and peace be with you all. In Christ's name, let's say together, amen. Please join and greet one another with the peace and love of Christ.